Hello again. It is my pleasure to introduce um, a woman that I look up to. She is the Executive Vice President at AstraZeneca and also the head of Metamune. Dr. Bahija Jalal joined Metamune as VP of Translational Sciences in 2016, and she became the head of Metamune in 2013. She guided the company through an unprecedented expansion of its pipeline. And in fact, in 2007, Metamune accounted for only 5% of the overall AZ pipeline, and today it represents approximately 50%. She has authored more than 70 peer-reviewed publications and hold, holds more than seven, 15 patents. She received her master's degree and her doctorate in Paris, France, and conducted her doctoral research at Max Planck Institute in Germany. Recently, she was named the Woman of the Year by the Healthcare and Business Women Association. And there are dozens more accolades that I could tell you about, but I wanted to let you know her involvement in GAP Summit. So in 2014, Bahija went to the inaugural GAP Summit in Cambridge and was so impressed with what they put together that she came back to her team and said, we have to bring this to the US. And she planted this seed that now has grown into what you see today. And it was really her vision and her leadership and her entrepreneurial spirit for making something that she really saw a lot of value in um, to happen, the reason that you guys are here today. So please, Dr. Jalal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, so uh, vision without execution is nothing. So I can have a vision, but it's really thanks to, to the committee who put it together and actually make it a reality. So you should be really very proud, and I hope uh, you're all enjoying uh, the summit. For me, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here because, um, like I say always, you know, you're the future. And I have to, you know, be resting easy at some point in my life thinking that the future is all in your hands. But when I look at you guys, this generation is amazing. And I have no doubt that you're going to take us into, into I was gonna say the moon, but we've been there already. <laughs> Somewhere even beyond, beyond. I think that's, uh, um, your, uh, your generation is fantastic. So um, what I wanted to do today, instead of uh, really telling you what we do in AstraZeneca and Metamune and stuff like that, you know, and it's a, a little bit of the company pitch, is to really talk about um, why innovation and driving innovation and where you you fit in and hopefully more having an interactive session because I would like to leave more times to interact with you than just, you know, talk at you. So why innovate? You know, why this is important? It is important, obviously, because it drives economic growth. Otherwise, you know, um, uh, countries will not go there. And with all the economic growth, increasing wages and other things, but when we are in the industry where we are, it also, it's also good for human health. We push the boundaries of science to help people. And that's, I think, for me, the most novel, uh, noble things to do. So, um, but I'm pretty sure you know, we don't uh, know enough um, or we don't realize enough that half of all economic growth has come from biomedical advances. And I'm not saying that for the companies or whatever, everything. When I say biomedical advances is the science done in academia is all the innovation, the research that we do, half of the economic growth comes from that. So it is important what we do. Um, if we look at just cancer alone or HIV, you know, the research that happens everywhere is what gets us today that people are living with their HIV, people are living with cancer. If you think about breast cancer, um, before it was a little bit of a death sentence. But today, if you look at you know, the pink marsh and other things, these are a lot of people who are living still with their, with their cancer. We have cancer survivors and even more. And that's thanks to the innovation that was brought into you know, the fight against cancer. So it is important what we do, and it is important what you do. 
that innovation doesn't happen unless we have people with disruptive thinking, right? And it's thanks to that disruption, people who actually don't accept the status quo, who constantly going to question the status quo. If you think about how we, what we are, you know, when we get educated is to ask questions, is not to accept that things are what they are and we just have to accept it and go with it. I think is having that mind uh, of being disruptive, being, you know, questioning the status quo is what led to all what we see today, right? Who thought, and you can raise your hands, that at any point we can disrupt the yellow cab in New York, right? But somebody did. At some point we were all comfortable that we can get into that cab and it's sometimes really not comfortable. But somebody, is the technology that brought us the Ubers and the Lyft. But for me, those are people who saw something and wanted to disrupt it and didn't accept the status quo. So how many of you still have CDs at home? Yeah, quite a few, but how many really, you know, uh, <laughs> have, <laughs> How many really use them? Yeah, only very, very few of them. Well, I'm not going to tell you that I am in the generation that we did have music on tapes. All right, but don't, don't count the, the years there. Uh, but, you know, this is that disruption that we actually now are all digital music services everywhere, you know, which is, again, people who challenge the status quo. And if you think about, you know, how we are in the generation, your generation is amazing, and the generation of your kids are going to be even more amazing because you grew up in that technology world, if you will. And we are continuing, right? This is, we are in unprecedented times. This is how I really look at it. We are in unprecedented times. You know, if you think about your grandparents or others, you know, maybe there was the TV or the radio that happened. In our lifetime, in your lifetime, all these innovations that happen, and when you look at all the informations that we have, so until 1900, human knowledge doubled every 100 years. Just think about that, every 100 years. Today, human knowledge is doubling every 12 months. And if you look at IBM, predicts that by 2020, the Internet of Things, if we take just one, one uh, segment here, will lead to doubling of knowledge every 12 hours. That's the era you're in. That's where we're heading. And that's why, you know, disruption and innovation will happen at a pace that is amazing. So just to elaborate on the Internet of Things, that it will lead to interconnection of 100 billion devices by 2020. And today, I'm pretty sure you know, some of you more than others, that we already have smart homes. I will classify my home as not really that smart. <laughs> um, but we are moving into smart cities and, and later on even to smart world. This is where we're heading, right? But I will appeal to all of you that this is the good side of the technology. This is the fantastic side of technology. But it's, it's really important for us as innovation and you know, technology and everything if we do it in the right way and be irresponsible. Because you can imagine, you can go to the other side with all that can turn against us as well. And we're seeing it. We're living it right now. But Technology and innovation is not going to stop, and it's going to be in our power to actually make it go into the, uh, for the good of the world. So this is what's happening around, around us, right? Not in, in um, how does it touch our industry. The way I look at it, and I want to uh, um, put some thought uh, for you, when we see almost, I showed you how many industries was disrupted, were disrupted. And then if you think about one industry that has not been really completely disrupted is our industry. 
is the pharmaceutical industry. There were tons of advances, and I'm going to go through some of them. We see definitely disruption, if you will, or um, at the level of the disease. It started with, uh, uh, or a big milestone was the sequencing of the human genome. It's starting to really understand the disease at the molecular level. Um, if you think about cancer, we are no longer going as a slash hammer and just taking, you know, uh, chemotherapy, which was already an innovation at that time, but going more into targeted therapy, you know, going um, much more targeted uh, in looking at the, uh, the cancer, which uh, brought a huge improvement, like I told you, in breast cancer and others. But we are now even beyond that. So the exciting things in cancer right now is the power, taking the power of the immune system to fight cancer and why everybody is so excited about that and we are far from, from done is the long time survival because one thing about the um, uh, immune system is the long lasting memory. You know, when you get vaccinated, that's what it is, is the long lasting memory. So for the first time, the C word is actually being talked about, which is cure. So this is a huge, huge advancement in understanding the disease, a huge advancement in actually starting to look at the role of the immune system in fighting cancer. When we look at rheumatoid arthritis, you know, the slash hammer there was more steroids, you know, using steroids with all the bad side effects and things like that. But having something like um, biologics getting into the rheumatoid arthritis with uh, things like Embril and others, TNF, alpha, without going into the details, it's not important. The details are not important. But this was, this is one now, um, the first uh, drug actually uh, sold drugs in, in the world. That made a huge difference for patients, for patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Why? Because understanding and really understanding the disease. And I can go on and on on other things from, you know, how some of the, the understanding uh, of the disease, like asthma, severe asthma, lupus, other things that, that we're doing. So, but also, the technology, starting to use the technology in what we do. So um, I'll give you an example is the smart pill bottle. It's basically one of the issues in um, the, the drug industry and, and, and most importantly for patients. And most of the patients is the compliance, is, you know, um, remembering to take your pill and things like that. And so this is one uh, smart pill bottle that basically will tell you, remind you that you have to take your pill and also uh, register for you that uh, you took the pill. So the future, the near future, it's not really very far future, is the ingestible sensor activated in the stomach. Basically, really, you took that and other things. So there is a lot of what we see in the wearables and other things that are starting to move into the healthcare uh, sector. But there are beyond, you know, where you really think about the future is how to use the whole bioprinting for human organs. It is not really a science fiction anymore. I think, you know, uh, we're, we're making a huge progress. You can see this is going to happen. It is going to happen. It's a matter of time. If you look at the gene editing and the whole CRISPR technology, how it's moving what we do in the lab, and maybe at some point, therapeutically as well, uh, as fast as, as, as possible, it's amazing. Or you look at also neural stimulation and neural prosthetics and, and other things. So really the use here of the technology to actually solve you know, problems for patients and for, uh, for people. So these are the technologies but I still, I said, you know, our industry is the one that has not been disrupted yet. Not as much. 
And because we can put all the excuses, is because it's highly uh, regulated, is, uh, um, you know, we can put all the excuses. But the thing is, I believe there is still, we should not accept that from an idea to actually bringing uh, a drug to a patient, to help patients, is still taking us more than 10 years. And that's a short period of time, right? But that's really where I feel we are, we have to think about how to disrupt our industry, not accept how we do things from the inside even, right? And I think that area is very, is very ripe. So who's going to do that? What do you think? That was the right answer. <laughs> that was the right answer. So what's my job in all that? What's the generation, my generation job is really to provide an environment where your innovation can thrive. And so I'll tell you, because this is, if you want to think about where we need to be, and all of you as you're thinking going into the future, we need to disrupt this industry from within, right? We need to take the technologies that are, you know, right out there and actually, you know, make our industry, make our, you know, bringing, helping patients much more efficient, much more fast, and even, um, you know, bringing to the next level because we live longer, diseases will stay with us, but we need to do even better. So my promise to you is my, hopefully, <laughs> I go everywhere, my generation, what's our job to prepare for you is absolutely important for us to provide that environment where your innovation can thrive. And at the same time, I'm saying that to you, that that's the environment you need to be looking for. So why this is important? So I made some observations, and I can tell you uh, some of the stories. How many people still go to libraries or went to libraries? Okay, maybe it's the next generation I'm t I have to talk to. <laughs> but generation needs, you know, starts happening really much faster. I can tell you because I have two daughters, uh, you know, five years uh, difference between the two. The first one stayed at, wanted to be in a, a G, uh, George Washington University because she was, her dream was to go to the Library of Congress and having those libraries and be in the library. Her sister, five years later, is saying, I can't stand it to be in the libraries. She prepared all her exams at Starbucks, right? But that's if you don't pay attention as us, that generation, how we bring you into the workforce, if we actually box you into, um, uh, into cubicles and things like that, I do believe we kill your innovation. So having an open space, letting, because that's what we're seeing. That's what the new generation wants. I don't know, I, I'm not trying to understand it, but it seems like you, le you need a lot more sensory stuff, you know, so I, <laughs> I can't, I need to focus. But I, I, that's, that's why it's, it's different. But what you also value, what the new generation values is very different from what my generation and generation before me values. And so you, we have, this is our job, is to actually really listen to what basically make it uh, what you need that your innovation uh, can thrive. And that's, I'm saying that from my point of view, but that's also for you when you're going somewhere, make sure that it's not an, uh, an environment that's going to kill your innovation. It is about collaboration, and I'm putting that here because it's really important, because I believe what's going to, the way uh, the next pharmaceutical companies or whatever, they're going to come, the next innovation is going to be at the intersection, right? It's at the intersection between the medicine and, and, and uh, the high tech and, and other things. That's where the future we're looking at. And I believe that's where you come in, because you grew up in that. So I want to leave you with this, that the future is in your hands. I told you it's going to be short because I want to more interact with you than just talk at you. 
And so my question to you, if your future is in your hands, I absolutely believe it, where will you take it? So now you talk, I respond. Go ahead. I mean, one of the ways uh, I see it is that science has been touched upon. So I'll start over. Uh, one of the ways I see it is that it's been touched upon today, actually, that science is a very technical field. And it's also a very hierarchical field because it takes time to acquire skills. It takes time to prove to oneself and to the rest of the world that what you're doing is fundamentally accurate, correct, reproducible. And there are issues in all of those that we all have heard about today. But if you don't do that right, then you run into what we saw recently with Theranos. Um, and one of the things that comes to be on our generation, I think, is how do you do it right? How do you engage, in a sense, the current leaders to try to break down those silos, break down those walls, but do it in a safe, effective, and science-specific way? Because we can't, being a practicing physician, seeing patients on the floor daily, you can't, in good consciousness, experiment on people. You can't do iterations, we heard on one of the panels, in real time on people. But yet, you have to do that in terms of you have to innovate. How do you do that in an ethical way, in a good way, in a sound way? Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a really great question. I think we, uh, I was just talking to a, a smart young lady, uh, she's here, uh, before. I do believe, and I put it on purpose, that slide for collaboration and innovation. You have to go with the premise and um, that not, there's maybe 1% of, of, or most of, no institution has all the answer, right? So we need to move, we are much better now, but we're not where we should be. Thinking science is about collaboration, innovation is about collaboration, and, and bringing, it's not a, a one-man sport. Right? It is about collaboration because not one single institution has all the, uh, the, the talent. You know, not one single institution has all the answer when not one single person has all the answer. And so it will bring me to one, I, I will go a little bit further, to one thing that's really close to my heart is, you know, why, why is it important to have diversity even, right? And, and for me, diversity is about the diversity of thought. And if you think about the diversity of thought, it's, it comes because we think differently, we act differently, you know, either you were raised here or here, if you're a man or a woman, if you're, you know, a minority or not, and stuff like that. So I think if you embrace that, then things go, go a lot better and a lot faster. And so let me tell you about some of the, again, the dogma or the, the biases that are stopping us from addressing exactly what you do. If you're in academia, you think science is done only that, companies don't know how to do science, and it's gonna be an insult to even go this way, right? Right now we can look at it the other way, and people from uh, companies thinking, you know, if you are this one from academia, you can have experiments that are not reproducible. But the thing is, you know, Academia cannot start becoming a company. Unfortunately, we've seen that. You know, people starting, some, some academia starting to do screening and stuff like that. And companies don't become just universities, right? The power comes when we talk to each other. This is just in our field. But what I am pitching to you is maybe the next pharmaceutical company is gonna come from a high-tech company, right? Is not to forget the other you know, adjacent things to us. Because that's, I think, what's gonna speed up what we do, what's gonna um, uh, get us to the next level. But it is, it is, if, and if you allow me for two seconds, maybe even how we teach needs to change, right? We go all the way as a one-man sport, as the survival of the fittest. If you're doing your PhD and then your postdoc and all the stuff, we're thought to be just, you know, 
it is survival of the fittest and then we get into the world and now you have to collaborate and do other stuff. Maybe we need to teach it differently. It's just something to think about. Hello, thank you for your talk. No problem. Uh, I've got a question around disruptive technology and innovation. Um, I'm a small molecule chemist and I think about disruptive technology and I think about a disruptive technology of the moderately recent past. So I think about high throughput screening and high throughput screening had a lot of advantages. It was very labor saving and we generated a lot of data very quickly. But without knowing what to do with that data, the law of unintended consequences meant we, we ended up with a lot of receiving, with not receiving, a lot of achiral flat molecules and um, we got the decline in R&D productivity that we all know about. So disruptive technology in science is fantastic. I mean, I think about the polymerase chain reaction and I think about John Reed uh, yesterday telling us about you know, doing polymerase chain reactions manually. And you, know, you think about the orders of magnitude um, improvement that you get in the lab now through um, innovations like that. And I believe that for simple tasks, uh, disruptive technology will be fantastic. But when it comes to original, creative, scientific um, innovation, um, what are the risks and how can we use this technology appropriately? Yeah, I think uh, it's, a, it's a really good point. I think when you do technology for the sake of technology, right, so it depends, so we're talking now really how that's getting to the R&D productivity and everything. I think it's, it's again, when you look at that intersection of understanding why are you trying to solve a problem versus, and, and we have it a lot in companies, right, where the technology is completely, this, you know, away from the biology, if you will. You know, so you, you bring all this fantastic technology and trying to, to actually just use them, right? Versus looking at the problem from different angles, what you're trying to solve for, and then bringing technology. This, I'm just talking in the, um, um, in the company uh, uh, side of things. So for me, it's really always important to really see what are we trying to do. You know, the, it's still the high throughput uh, screen was a fantastic way, basically, to, to move the field. But then we went maybe too far. And I, the same thing, I think, on um, uh, technologies in, in the biologics field right now. Again, how, what are we trying to do? And for me, it's always bringing that Technology, we have what we call the, the tech RSC or something, is bringing the biologists and the technology people together and start with what's the problem we're trying to solve. Sometimes you will have the technology that opens up again. CRISPR is, in, is, is one of them. It opens up what we can do and, and things like that. But I think you just have to constantly, at least for me, remind ourselves why we're doing what we're doing. I think the example you're talking about with the high throughput screening and the R&D productivity, we went just with the numbers, you know, and forget that there is also actually quality. It's not about quantity, it's about quality. And I think that's where the industry went a little bit in the wrong direction. It's easy to say it, you know, afterwards, but when you look at it, that's what it was. It was not the fault of the technology is what we do with it. It was a huge technology that really moved the field, but then it became, it's tempting. I did tell you, there's a lot of technology that I talked about that I am fascinated with in this world, but you know that you can also go completely in the other direction, in the wrong, in the wrong direction with the technology if you don't pay attention. In our world, that's what happens when you start just counting the number of things that you're bringing, you know, again, and not thinking about the, the, um, the, the quality of what you're bringing, that's more important. But it took a lot of lessons learned after that for the industry as a whole, what to do. Am I answering your question? Yeah. Hi, Beja, great talk. Uh, I'm Kamalika and I'm a postdoctoral fellow in MedImmune. 
Uh, so quick question regarding the disruptive uh, innovation per se. So we hear a lot of success stories, but behind every one... Disruptive what? I didn't hear you, sorry. Disruptive innovation yes. as well as technologies. So we hear a lot of success stories, but we also don't, we don't see the number of failures that yeah. went on to creating one thing. On the company perspective, uh, your opinion on... How do you how do you promote like how do you encourage your employees to take the risk factor? Because many a times when things fail, it might be disruptive, but many a times they might fail, right? So that's where the profitability aspect also comes into play. So as as a leader, where do you see the exact balance? Like which which path would you actually follow? I for me it's really simple. If we don't fail, then we're not innovating. You know? Because if you don't fail, you're not innovating. And I think it's how you put failure for, for people. If it's a failure because if it's a failure and then you, you learn from it and you move on, I think that's really important. If you are cautious constantly, you're not innovating. It's easy. It's easy to get into you know, just making the second and the third generation, you know, just improving a little bit on what other people have done. You can't be always, you know, in, in uh, a safe situation because diseases and stuff like that, you have to move, you have to take risks. But as a leader in the organization, it's how you respond to that it really determines the culture if people are gonna take a risk or not, right? I talked about on purpose what's, what's my job, that's how I see my job, is how I actually put that environment, you know, my team and I and everybody, is really making sure that that environment is important for people to innovate. And that means to the level where somebody comes to you with an idea, you can kill innovation by just saying, I've done it before, it didn't work, right? So one thing I say always to people, is don't say, don't say there is a, this is how we do it at MedImmune. I hate that, right? Because you're basically hiring people and then you say, okay, this is how we do it, this is how you should do it. But when you hire people, you want them to come with their ideas, you know? So don't kill that. I have, I absolutely don't believe there is a correlation, you know, how many times you fail to the product, to how much money you're gonna make or whatever, because we know you have to have First of all, you have to be really, um, uh, to get into this, in the areas where we are, you know you're gonna fail nine times and if you succeed one time, but then in a, big, in a big way is when you take risks. But you have to take measured risks as we say, but you have to take risks. It's if you, I start worrying if we're not failing, then we're really not innovative. Thank you. Uh, well, my question is regarding the Internet of Things that you that you talk about. Yeah. I mean, it's clear that. Yourself, uh, sorry. Introduce yourself. Okay, I'm I'm Vicente. I'm studying a master in entrepreneurship and business design in biomedicine in Salgrens Academy in Gothenburg in Sweden. That's great. And uh, well, and regarding the Internet of Things, okay, it's clear that this innovation is moving towards this direction, and uh, you say also that. Um, Pharma industry is a very traditional industry, an industry that moves pretty slow. But I think that that's uh, mainly because of the strict regulation that it has to face. So my question is, do you think that some days, and facing all this innovation that we have now, regulation policies will catch up you know, to the speed of innovation? Yeah, so, so thank you. Um, I put it on purpose, you know, so trying to just provoke your thoughts a little bit. Um, and I said it, I said that one of the excuses we say is highly regulated, right? There are, and again, I am very sensitive to how we can kill innovation everywhere. Because most of the time, as human beings, we're really, we tend to be comfortable. You know, we tend to be comfortable. What we know is what we know and we go with it. And one thing that I hear constantly is we're highly regulated. Well, guess what? I think the FDA is actually a little bit more progressive right now than we are, right? It's, 
nobody, if there are regulations on things that exist already, you know, if we, we disrupt things, if we come with new things, then we'll bring the FDA with us as well, and I think they're more open. So I do believe that we have, we can move more aggressively into, um, you know, disrupting a little bit how we do things and use the technology. And sometimes, this is just an idea for you, and I can tell you one experiment we've done. Um, sometimes it's, it's, it's having that a mixture, you know, of people coming from different disciplines that's going to move us much faster. I'll give you an example. I have somebody who is really extremely, uh, you, you, you spot those people who are completely creative, but they're always disruptive. They always think out of the box. Um, and he, you know, when, uh, without going into the details, when you make biologics, you make them from, you know, small volume, and then you go into this big, you know, volume, and usually you try, you try the conditions, and, you know, to go to big volumes, you have, you know, you do the big run, and the first one, it costs a lot of money and time, and he came and he said, I want to hire a mathematician who has not been in our industry at all, right, to really address that. I'm always open for these kind of things, you know, but I sometimes, most of the time, I'm skeptical. But I make sure that I don't say, you know, I said, yeah, interesting. <laughs> and I thought it's going to take forever, you know, for this person to do. But hey, it's a, it's a great experiment for somebody to, to come. This mathematician actually with his formula, don't ask me how he did it, um, you know, really adjusted all the parameters that we can go from a lower volume to the big tanks with complete prediction that basically that you don't have huge CO2 and kill the cells and stuff like that. And we did, I have to actually go and ask because the last time I asked we had two or three drugs that went through the process without a failure. So basically you can predict now from here to here. But it was a mathematician. This is why I'm trying to provoke you guys is to say, the next innovation is going to come from that intersection. Is maybe is you know, and you see it a little bit happening already, right? You see the Googles of the world are going in that direction and things like that. And instead of, you know, us brushing them off or doing stuff, we need to embrace that because they're looking at, we are still used to doing what we do. Somebody has to come from the outside and see it differently as well to disrupt it. And I think then the regulation will go with it. There was no regulation for the internet. You know, nobody knew that these things was even going to come, right? But then you develop it as you go. But you can't, um, we are slow in adopting things. And I think we, uh, the way things are, are going, we can't be slow anymore. We need to adopt a lot more the technology and, and disrupt. Like I said, we are in the best position to disrupt ourselves if we choose to. Hi, um, so I'm a plant scientist, so I don't know much about this, but I'm just wondering, this whole sensation of innovation is like going forward, but how much are they like reconsidering? Because now that we have all this technology, we have all these traditional plants that now we have a lot more sensitive analysis to, under to find. Um, there's recently this publication from Cornell where they're finding like derivatives of salicylic acid, which are a lot more efficient, a lot more effective. They can be used for different types of diseases. How much are we considering past knowledge and like bringing it up to date? Like, is that an active part of research? I think, I think constantly you're looking at past knowledge and how you, you know, it's constantly, we're constantly going back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth, right? Um, so I, I, I don't see that you have to do one or the other. I think you have to do both, right? So that's why you have in, in the workplace, you have to have, you know, my generation and your generation. You look at things that the way we've done it for so long and you look at it, you know, how we can use the technologies of the world. If I'm understanding your question. Yeah. Is it that analogy, or are people just trying to develop new processes or people it, it, Look, if you define a really innovation, it's never just a completely something completely new, right? It's sometimes an incremental on something that existed already, and that's a big, that's a big innovation. So you, you uh, absolutely, you always look back and you look forward and you look what you can use. Jeff? 
Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm very excited uh, with the talk. Um, so thanks for your time. You. Uh, I have a question about this uh, emerging technologies, also call it uh, dual technologies. And the thing is that uh, in the school, we are learning, uh, for example, I'm studying biotech, we are learning uh, this beautiful, now awesome technology that you can do almost uh, anything if you uh, put your mind to just to f flow. But then you find out with a real uh, panorama, it's very different. And I know, uh, speaking about public per uh, perception of these emerging dual technologies, I think that we need to make a big effort on the educational part, uh, specifically as a, talking about bioethics and, and something like so social biotechnology and, there's, and there are topics that they don't give us on the university. So the question is, uh, there's some way that we could uh, centralize uh, the risk assessment for all the technologies and without taking an over precautorian uh, vision of these new technologies and how we can reduce or improve this uh, public perception. Yeah, I think, uh, so I'll take the public perception is a, is a really tough one for us because, and I go maybe a little bit even beyond, beyond that because I think, um, I, I, I did say for everything we do, obviously we have to be responsible. We put things in place that you're, um, you know, and it's a fine balance that you don't stifle that innovation just by identifying all the risk possible because that's sometimes we go through that as well. Um, I think the public perception is something else completely. I think um, I go back to even our education and what we do. We don't show, you know, we are the worst communicators. Scientists are the worst communicators. And the minute we start actually admitting that we have to communicate better, right, to the public, to everything, um, companies have also a responsibility. What we put out there, you know, media has its responsibility. What we like to show out there is the marketing and this and that. We don't show the scientists who actually work. Some of them are going to work all their life without ever having been associated with the drug, right? But they work, they, how many scientists really get into this field for the money? How many did they, of you get here for the money? Not that many, right? Because if you actually do, how, you know, it is not a very a favorable thing because you go, you do PhD, and then you go and work for a, a lower than the minimum wage. Uh, you don't do that because you want to make money. You would do that because you love what you do and you're passionate about the science, you're passionate about, you know, and I'll talk about my industry. Scientists who are passionate about, you know, helping patients. You know, I just come from, you know, the ASCO for oncology where we had three, three patients that were helped with three of our uh, cancer drugs. We had people in tears, but those are the people who brought those drugs and everything. We don't show that side, right? So we are, yeah, it is really disturbing. And sometimes when I give a talk in the company and people say, you know, we do what we do and we know we're proud of what we do, but when you go to, um, you know, parties or you hear in the press, we are almost the lowest uh, thing right now. It's almost, uh, we are worse, or not worse, I think we're still a little bit better than the tobacco company, right? Uh, and that doesn't feel really good. But except, I, you know, I don't want to be on the defensive constantly. We need to really look at how we communicate. We don't communicate very well. How many people get a communication, you know, training uh, in the university? Zero, that's not in our curriculum, right? You go through 28th grade and you have no communication. So we need, and especially now without being political, now that science is put into, into the stuff, you know, how to explain it better to the public what we do and why we do it and how we care. You know, it's a soft thing, but it's an important thing. It's really an important thing for me. It's not going into 
trying to justify that what we do is ethical and things like that. We do it all the way, all the time, but we don't communicate well. And it, the press doesn't help us either. Well, <clears throat> it's an excellent talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, there are three different models for innovation that I have learned. One is the problem-based, like do you give the problem and they solve it, the innovator. The other is like uh, you have the interdisciplinary approach. You bring the people from different disciplines and they solve the problems. And the third one is like you give the tools and people play with it and they come up with something yeah. new. So I have learned. So, and in another talk, I have learned that more than 50% innovation are in universities and in academic institutes. And uh, there is one traditional model for the universities, just like we are sitting in one of the universities. And then there is a new model for innovation in some of the universities, like I visited Singapore University of Technology and Design. And they are mainly working on problem-based solutions. So they give the problems to the uh, students and they solve those problems and this is how they are bringing innovation and one of the leading university in the United States is MIT so they also have a different model for innovation so what do you think how we can improve the education and innovation ecosystem in universities and then uh, another question is like you have given the correlation between the innovation and economies I what I have learned all the countries who are like the developing countries they are very bad uh, back in innovation, like I can give the example of Pakistan, I'm from Pakistan. So Pakistan is standing at 119th position among 100, 128 countries in global innovation index. So how these developing countries can improve and how they can bring change in their innovation ecosystem in universities? Wow, I'm gonna, <laughs> it's, a, it's a really interesting topic because um, uh, you know, the short answer to the, I, I like the three models and I think you need to do all three of them, right? Because each one of us reacts differently and have, it's, it's adapting the, again, the environment that you can cultivate all three of them. And I think as much as I say it for the companies, the universities is no, is no different. I think we're gonna, again, I talked about disruption in my industry. I think there will be a disruption of the education, you know? the how we educate everybody on the same things, you know, it's a little bit changed from here to there, but I think the next really big thing is gonna be in the education. We're still, we're still unfortunately educating everybody, uh, and I'll just talk about the areas that I know. Um, even we're educating everybody and, and also preparing everybody in one single single uh, outcome is that, at least in the US, the way I look at it, is um, that if you have a successful career, you're gonna be a tenured professor somewhere. And really, my work with some of the universities and, and some of my advocacy work is, we need to prepare people for everything. It's, the, it's actually, that's what makes it even more interesting to be, in, and we have to start also uh, seeing that, um, you know, biotechs and, and, uh, and, and some companies are, are contributing definitely big time to this innovation. So we need to accept that, we need to embrace it, we need to actually celebrate it that if we wanna, and then, and then you start looking at how you prepare for the curriculum in a, in a different way. I do believe that there will be disruption there. I think in the economies, you know, if you look at the example of China, you can see that shift happening it's not because it's nice, it's because that's where the economic growth is, is gonna e even explode. So um, I think the uh, uh, how, uh, again, is making that correlation. That's why I started, why, why does it even matter, right? Why does it even matter to, to have that? Is getting people to understand that when you have, again, those numbers, we don't show them so, so much, the bio, uh, health uh, stuff is 50% of the growth. Why this is important for you? And I'll leave you with this one thought that I said already is, uh, again, if you wanna advocate for something, you have to show people what's in it for me, why this is important for what you do. Um, as I was discussing um, with the, the young lady, I never go for you know, we need more women into, into uh, industry or 
or whatever, I go with we need more diversity of thought if we want to be more innovative. As a consequence, you will have more women, you will have more minorities, you'll have those kind of things. So it's making that linkage, you know, why this is good for you. Because if it's not, if you're just coming to convince somebody to do something, they're not going to do it, right? And we need to do the same thing with the academia, with other things. So, Dr. Thank Jalal, you. thank you for your tireless efforts in engaging and inspiring our leaders of tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much.